welcome to this edition of the fourth year sponsored by Classic Auto Insurance. And today we have a very special guest. If you wanted to know anything about vintage racing and that whole world, this is the guy to talk to, Tony Perella. Tony, hello. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Jeff, thanks for having me on. It's, uh, it's good to finally catch up with you, my friend. When we first met, I was working for Ford Haycock, who was actually the founder of SVRA back in 1978. And they said that SVRA has this new owner, Tony Perella. And I thought, who is this? Who is this guy? So let's start by you came from the business, very successful business world, and somehow you had a relationship or uh, how did you get tied into or become, literally, you became the vintage racing go-to guy with SVRA? You know, it's been a fun journey. As, as you said, most, most of my career was frankly nothing to do with racing. It was uh, in telecommunication. I was fortunate enough to work with a couple of different folks that took two companies public and did very well, then I, then I bought a company out of bankruptcy and turned it around and actually sold it to Aero Electronics, who you see involved with IndyCar and Formula One and so on. So I had a, a storybook career, I guess you could say, in telecom. But to be honest with you, I never was passionate about the products I sold. I was passionate about the people that we work with. We had a great business culture. But nobody ever came up to me and said, God, I love my telephone. You know, it was, it was an, a means to the end. When I sold uh, my last company, Share Technologies, to Arrow, I found myself at a crossroads at 50 years old. What am I going to do the rest of my life? I still want to work and contribute. But I didn't really see me going back to Wall Street or going back to telecommunications. I wanted to do something that I really cared about. And in that process, I did a, uh, a form of an MBA at Harvard. And I presented two business cases when I went to school. One was to buy SDRA and build this national footprint of vintage racing and try to elevate vintage racing to mainstream motorsports in America. That was my business plan. And it had several elements of having a national championship at CODA being the first to crack the code to race in Indianapolis, put a national footprint together. If you brought enough racers, you would attract race-related brands as well as luxury brands because of the demographic that vintage has vintage racing. And kind of up the game. And when I when I presented that to the to the professors and the folks at Harvard, they they didn't think it was too good of an idea. It, they based it on three things, the macroeconomics of the sport, if you want to call it a sport at that time, nobody was really doing it and profitable. So they looked at that and saying, well, that's a red flag. When they looked at the financials of SVRA, it was only running three events. And frankly, the previous owner was propping it up to do that out of the goodness of his heart. The macroeconomics of the business was not good. And, and then the final piece was, was your business plan realistic? Could it be executed on? And they didn't think that was good because if, if it was that easy, somebody would already have done it. And I had a very different view. You know, I looked, I, I did my homework. I looked at what, you know, Wally Park did to the NHRA. You look what Jim France did to stock car racing. It, it was clear to me that the same opportunity exists. looked a little different. And much later in life. So it was that, or I submitted a second business plan to buy Harry and Dave a fruit basket company out of bankruptcy. So a lot of people in the business buy their products at Christmas time or what different occasions. And when it got down to it, they gave me a growing grade for that thesis because it was over a billion dollar company. It was a good space, well known. They just had hard times and I could use them bankruptcy process that gone into bankruptcy to shed all the sins of the past and revitalize coming. They thought that was great. Well, needless to say, I didn't sell pairs. I went the other way and, and bought up SVRA. And, you know, it's really been uh, an amazing journey. I, I, I really, today, you know, September will be 
exactly 10 years that it closed on the Kainos VRA. And, you know, I don't know if I truly saw we would become, you know, own Trans Am, F Formula Radio, Formula 4, be the sanctioned, professional sanctioning group, SCCA Pro now, and all the rights to that. And then SVRA going to a national scope the way it has. You know, I knew we were going to be successful. I didn't know we'd get to the scale. And, and I, what's interesting is here we are, I'm coming up on my 10 year anniversary. I don't feel like we haven't got started yet, what we're going to become. And so it's, it's not been easy. I got a phenomenal team that works their tails off to make the spectators, the car show attendees, or the racers feel welcome. Where they're hardworking kids group that care about it and care about the sport. But it's been, you know, we, we weathered COVID. We, you know, when you're in the event business, COVID and event business aren't a great marriage, but we, we, we got through that. I'm proud we didn't lay a single employee off through, you know, in 2020 or 21 with all the change and uncertainty, we, we weathered the storm very well. It was not easy, but we, at the end, Today I'm grateful, and and I and I think my team is, and I hope it, 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 you know the competitors are as well. You know, no doubt, all eyes were on you. I I met you uh, for the first time in Orlando, I believe it was, and PRI at that point was in Orlando, and we sat down, and I heard you because of whom I was working for at the time. I was very familiar with all the challenges SVRA had had. And I heard you talk about your vision and what you were gonna do. And I gotta be quite honest, we kind of walked away shaking our head thinking, you know, is this guy a dreamer or is this really possible? And, and maybe it's a little of both. Maybe you did have this great vision and you didn't hinder yourself with all the reasons it could not work. You only looked at all the opportunities to make it work. And you've done that. You grew back in 1978. There were like 25 registered racers. You're today, if my numbers are correct, you're pushing the envelope of over 2,500 registered racers today. That's huge. Plus, you're racing in all the major racetracks in America. I mean, Charlotte, Laguna Seca, Atlanta, Sebring, uh, Watkins Glen, the Circus of America. When, when you started to look at your business plan, people started to follow you right away. I don't know if they started to follow you because they thought you were kind of crazy or if they followed you because they said, you know what? I like this guy's plan. What do you think? Well, I think, I think both, actually. I think there were people... And as there are today, you could you could pull anybody who drives a race car and manages race and say, and you will have me, you will get two different perspectives on me. And and that's it goes with the territory when you change. I, I would say 90 plus percent of the people who race at one of our events are thrilled and have a ball. But there's there are some of the older guard who have been at it for a long time and they could go to a very relaxed find small event no spectators no sponsors just just enjoy the car for what it is as a club level i still love to do that that's nothing wrong with that and, but you can't race at all the tracks that you mentioned live stream put it on you know CBS sports and all the other entitlements that we bring to a party when we show up and, and if you want to do it on just an entry-based model. It's flat. Financially, you can't connect the dots. It was very early on, I realized, if I don't make some tweaks to this business plan, I'm going to, I'm, it's not going to work. And how we went about that is, is, it's been a journey. And, I, and I've done some things that I look back and I go, what the hell was I thinking? That's, that was a, you know, it was a dumb move, but we've done some things that were innovative to the sport. The good news is we've done way more right than we've done wrong. And I would say 99, probably 99% of people are thrilled with what we're doing. And there's 1%. It is what it is. I, and we even 1%, we are killing ourselves to get the goal line to make them happy. But some folks, you know, it, it, everybody has a view of what vintage racing should be. And 
we don't always fit that. It is with our best efforts to put on the best events we can, they think it should be a little different. I, I often joke and say, I, I feel like everybody's wedding planner in that when I put on a weekend, it's, they think it's their perfect, you know, their perfect wedding. And I swear to you, we really do try to make everybody happy, but some, sometimes it's tough. But by and large, I got the best team in racing, and, and they, we, the reviews we do after each event, what could we do better? And then the team is, is really incredible. And it's been, it's clearly been a labor of love, just not just for me, but everyone who works at, at, at a Trans Am or SVRA or any of our, our groups. They're, you, your uh, events are not really an experience. I mean, you, I remember going to the very early events where, like you said, it was kind of like a club meet. You know, the racers showed up, they kind of went on the field. You might have had a few spectators, but now you go to an event, there's a lot of spectators, there's vendors, there's there's all kinds of activities, there's things going on, there's things to do. It becomes an experience like, you know, if you if you go to Indianapolis and uh, to the Motor Speedway or you go to that, it, it's, it's quite a different um, experience today than what it was. And you know, that has to do with, as you said, your team, the promotion, the logistics of each and every one of these events. And you mentioned earlier, you've got over 20 events now. Yeah, there's actually this year, if you look at all of our properties, there'll be 23 events. Most of them are at the anchor tenant SRA, but there's a couple exceptions to that. We will raise Trans Am, we'll raise at the... Uh, Big Machine back on Music City Grand Prix with IndyCar. Uh, Trans will also race with NASCAR at World America. And then uh, in all likelihood, it's not official yet, but what, last year, we're, we're working on the project now. Last year, we had a Formula 4 race, with an F1 race weekend at Coda. So, you know, those three events are outside of what we call our speed tour platform, where you have the whole band together where you have SVRA or you'll have IGT or you'll have Trans Am or sometimes we'll have F4 or F Formula Regional all on the same weekend or, or, or different groups coming in and out. And it really makes for an eight in the morning to six at night festival. And, you know, as an example, Jeff, you, you it's my first year at Seabrain as an owner was 2013. We took, we took a ton of photos, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in data and detail to, to track if you're on, if you're going the right direction or not. That, that was the foundation of what all my business career. And I was looking back a few weeks ago at the paddock photos, aerial photos of the paddock in 2013. And we had total 119 cars at that moment. And this coming week from next and the end of next week, um, we have 72 Trans-Am cars. We have 50, I think 57 IG cars, 175 vintage cars already signed up, and they're the slow pokes getting signed up. And we'll have, we have already taken entries of over 350 car show cars. Our gate is pre-sale is what it bigger than it was the first four years that we even had total with walk up and most of the most of the spectators for vintage racing at least don't pre pre buy they show up at the gate would and buy the tickets so by every measurement this Sebring will set a new high or new bar for revenue car count and participation and and if you take that picture and you put it out over our other speed tour events, it tells the same story. And they're all in different phases of their evolution. You know, this year we added New Jersey. We added, we, we've had, last year we added Utah. We added Willow Springs. So not, you know, it's not an Indy race. It's not a Seaburn race, not a Coda race. But nonetheless, all the, you know, you look at Mid-Ohio race, you look at, at Road America, those, those events of Watkins Glen, those events are all continuing to set new highs and new bars, and it's, it's been a blast. It, it's, our data 
We have over 2,500 SBRA license members, but we have over 20,000 people who in the last 10 years, different people have come out and race or, or raced in the van or that we, you know, we've really built this thing. And it's, it's just awesome to see the growth. But again, as I said, I, I feel like we're just getting started. And the cars, you know, uh, you know, a little bit of everything. So you have different classes of cars. It's not necessarily a, a specific year, but you you do it by classes and tell us, I mean, I've seen uh, things from F1 formula cars to vintage racing cars. Tell us a little bit about what does a, a particular race look like? How do you decide your classes? How do the cars run? Well, first, first and foremost, we're, we're about trying to be as safe as humanly possible. And we try our best to be inclusive to anybody who has got a competition license and their car is prepared to our set of rules we we welcome racers and the challenge with vintage racing is look at in regular racing I mean professional racing that's not spec it's very hard to manage tech to be a level playing field in vintage racing you're going back in some cases over a hundred years of technology and you only have 10 or 12 classes at any given race, how do you possibly level the playing field from a competition standpoint into a fair footprint and, and, and make it fun for all the competitors? So we have tried, and, and it's not an exact science, it's a constant evolution. We have tried to um, put a fair set of rules that focus on tires, displacement, brakes, and weight. If you get those four things right for a set for a class of cars, there's still opportunity to do some development, but at the same time, that keeps them, frankly, with an amateur level skill set, that keeps the playing field fairly close. Perfect. There, there is no perfect when you're trying to cover 100 years, but um, it's working. And as some guys age out or some groups start to scale down new groups. I think we were the first to bring in Mazda Miatas to race. And we run them in a separate group. And there was, oh God, the pushback saying he's lost his mind. What's he doing with Miatas racing at his race weekend? Well, you know, there's some of our most best racing in, 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 in today's world. The Europeans are familiar with it, but they may not MG is or a Triumph is that back in my day in high school, those were cool cars, right? But so as as the sport has evolved, we try to evolve with it. When I came to SVRA, the only thing that we would allow is up to 1972. Well, what's wrong with the 1992 car or a 2002 car as long as it's class right? So as we as we have evolved, well, sometimes consolidated groups that have separate podiums, it just depends on the car count. But to show you the range, at uh, this year at Watkins Glen, we have two feature marks. We have Bugattis and we have Mustangs. Well, the Bugattis are the early 1900s, the Mustangs are the in 60s to 70s era. Those are our two feature marks. You go to my Indianapolis Speedway event this year, we'll have a whole section on historic, that'll be a class, but we'll also be uh, doing pre-1920 pre-war that one of the cars ran in the original uh, Indianapolis 100. So, you know, right up to modern day, uh, just just up, you know, just now new cars come out with professional race cars, so we'll, you know, stock cars, whatever. We, we are all, but we try to lump it together. So for the fan, they got something that makes sense that they look at on the track. For the driver, it's safe. And B, they got something to go, somebody to go race against and have a good time. And that, to me, is our version of racing. There's people that don't think that's the right rest. But on a national scale, we, we think it is. It's, you know, what are some of your, looking back a little bit, um, what are some of your best memories of vintage racing? And uh, again, you know, when I, when we first met, 
you had a huge challenge ahead of you. And today you have a laundry list of partners and sponsors. And, you know, it's looking at this today from where you started is, is, is a completely different playbook. What are some of your what are some of your, your, your best memories of this journey? There's, there's, there's been several. That, that I'll start with and I'll finish that with a positive. The downside of what we've created is I don't personally get to race anymore. We've gotten so big that to do justice to the weekend and my customers, the racers and spectators and car companies, it doesn't afford me the opportunity to go racing. And and our scale is just to that point where I need to focus on the business and uh, my personal enjoyment of a racer. Having said that, the, the journey of running the company has been one thing and, and the success we've enjoyed and, and all that. As a racer, Far and away, the best best experience of my life in a race car, and I've been racing since I was 15 years old. My dad had a sign for me and drive me to the racetrack because I didn't have a New York State license. But then once I got to the track, it was legal because he signed off for me to go racing. That's how, that was a long time ago. All those years of racing in a race car, uh, and whether I want to race or whatever, without question, there's one experience I had in a race car that will my favorite memory favorite event and i came in 11th uh, is one raced, and i raced in a v-rock race then it's raced the champions at indianapolis motor speedway and my co-driver was al Unser senior who who just recently passed away i still have to pinch myself that we built such a friendship over the years i've built a great relationship with the Unser family uncle bobby johnny and and, and of course, Dale Senior. And, and I had started the relationship when I held what we called the Unser Family Reunion, where I brought each of the Unsers, all five of them, to Indianapolis, put them on a track in a car that they drove in their career, and just made it about them. And the fans loved it. They loved it. Getting them all together that had never been done. And other than Uncle Bobby thinking that, he was qualifying for the 500 and Al telling me he didn't think he needed a helmet in the race car. It went relatively smooth, but the friendship that I formed with all of them over from that point on is, is you know, I'm, I'm they're, I really care about these folks. They're not, they're not just some race hero. They're, but the, the thing that blew me away Al Senior, I was at, uh, he had done the Unser family reunion. The following night was at the 500 in the Pagoda, and we bump into each other. And we talked, we were watching the race, and he said something to me. He says, you know, I still think, now he's in his mid-70s, he goes, I still think I can be competitive in a race car. And I said, well, would you like to race again? I go, I got a race in three weeks at here on the road course. I can fix you up. You could be in our vintage race, the champion charity race. And most important, you could race against little L and show them how the, how the real winners do it. And one thing I do another, he agreed, but he threw me a curveball. He said, you know, Tony goes, I, I think I really want to race. He goes, who would my coach ever be? I go, <laughs> I'm pretty sure anybody you want, uh, your your royalty around here, four time winner, and all you've accomplished. I know my vintage racers would be any one of them would be honored to race with. He goes, oh no 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 no. He goes, you have a Corvette, right? Well, yeah. He goes, Good. you're my co-driver. So he recruited me to race with him. So I brought him in Indianapolis a day early. Been in a car competitively in over 25 years at that point. And first, I had little Al in the back seat, big Al in the passenger seat, riding shotgun, and I drove them around the road course to show them the line and the marks in an Avis rent a car. And then I switched seats with Al, and that started our weekend. And his biggest concern, he was worried he would somehow hinder my chance of winning the race. That was all he cared about. And who cares? <laughs> I, I win or lose. I just wanted the, the sheer joy and watching 
watching little Al talk, his father around the race course, being with that with Al the whole changing the uh, because he was a little bit shorter than me and propping the seat up so he could see over that corner and it was an experience of a lifetime. Now we ended up, I think it was a lot out of 33 cars the field of 33 that year. And terrible, you know, big fan. Nobody's gonna write a story about our finished position. But for me, the friendship that we forged that weekend, especially me and Big Al, carried over to he passed away. And I'll close with on that on that point. You know, growing up, that's the answers and Johnny Lightning Car, and that was when the hook was set for, for me as a race fan for Indy. As my father's chairman before, I'm an answer fan, right? And and that watching the 500 and the excitement and camaraderie had every man we would watch it on TV. We didn't have money to go, we would watch it on TV. To know that I was driving with Big Al, who was my hero. Well, years later, after we drove together, he would be Grand Marshal. He was Grand Marshal of Portland. He was Grand Marshal for me at Coca. And we would, we would go out and have a great dinner, but it was amazing is after we were at Coda three years, his last time being at the track with me as a grand marshal. And he says, I, I need to have a talk with you. I noticed you're really struggling with your hearing. What, what, what are you doing? I said, well, I had a tumor removed 30 years ago on this side, I lost my hearing and my right side, honestly, Al, I'm, I'm coming to an end, I can't communicate normally anymore. My hearing's that bad. He said, Monday, you're in Minneapolis, and you're going to meet a friend of mine, Bill Austin, who owns Starkey Hearing Aids. Susan and I will set up a meeting. You're going Monday. Monday, I flew to Minneapolis. I met with the CEO of Starkey Hearing Aids. Amazing man who built these things, these clinics in third world countries all over the world. He cut kids who have never heard here for the first time. He spent the morning building a custom hearing aid. They put me through the most extensive hearing test I've ever had in my life. And I've had plenty. They customized the hearing aid. And it was life changing. I, honestly, I was at a point where I thought I had to get, give up my role in the business because I couldn't function. I couldn't hear anymore. After that experience, I wrote a letter right up until two weeks before he passed away. He would check in with me every couple of weeks. ATP, is your co-driver, how's your hearing? His own set of health issues. He's, he's terminal with cancer. This had been going on. He'd been playing. He never would know it. But yet he took the time to call to check on my hearing and through all that. So, and here's something as simple as racing together, the friendship that was forged and I, you know, I to the, you know, to the rest of my life, he was like, almost like a second dad, uh, that figure in my life. And so I, I miss him terrible. But when I think back to our experience, it was, and I can't help but smile because we had such a blast. And the, the friendship that was forged all Cross vintage racing of the guys who raced in the V Rock series, you know, our vintage racing champions part uh, is still going strong today. I, you know, I see these guys interact with each other, they come to a race or they go to each other's uh, house. It's just all the different racing. Uh, it, when I talk to the people that are there, talk to the racers, talk to as they're, they're getting ready to go out and compete and do things. They're extremely approachable. You've really built an incredible family. And what is the best advice you could give someone who is interested in vintage racing? Are, are there different levels? Is there a starting point? What would you tell our viewers today of, hey, I, I, this sounds really fun. How, how do I start? The, the barrier to entry is, I think, never been easier to race if you want to race and you don't it, racing is expensive of any form i don't if you came out the hard way you can't look at racing as an inexpensive sport i can tell you however there are options that are are reasonable 
and obtainable from a financial standpoint. Start with, I would go to uh, a driving school and, and get your get your start, get the fundamentals of racing. I would read, uh, make sure you understand the flagging so you're safe out there and, and understand. And I would go see how you feel in the car at speed in one of the race schools. And there's, it's not hard to find. We, we have Skip Barber, we have Kaisen, we have Bedford, all associated with the Pearl Motorsport properties at some level are great. There's other schools out there, Mid-Ohio School, Allen Burgs School. There's, there's great, it's a, it's a great space to go that somebody can go learn how to go racing to start with. And then I would rent, literally rent a, a Miata and race in a couple of Miata class races. The racing's competitive. The cars are manageable. Even if you, you, you think you're ready for more horsepower, I would start with a Miata to get your, just get, get all of this down, get your head right where you're smooth in the car. You'll fast, when you're fast in a Miata, you can be fast with a car with horsepower, I can tell you that. And so I think that's, I encourage people to start on a smaller scale. Don't start with something that's really a handful because there's so much you've taken in of learning a new track, learning racing, being aware of what's going on around you. Things happen at a little slower rate in the Miata than they would in a, in, you know, in a group six muscle car or a, an open wheel, uh, you know, our group nine, which are former Indy cars. So up to that. So I think, I think um, I would start small, get your confidence, get good, get a reputation where you're fast, but safe and don't put other people at risk and then move up. That's, that's how I would say, it. but virtually anywhere in the country. And there's several local vintage racing clubs that, you know, are, regionally typically um that are inexpensive to race in they run good good events and track time track time track time get you get you ready to where you can step out and try one of the big ones so if someone wants to join the vintage racing svra what are the costs to join are there any requirements to join and how, how do they reach out to you how do they join uh, there's as a, as a member or a fan, there's a package they can buy as a membership, go to all of our races and get our speed tour magazine shipped to their house quarterly. And, and it's a real high end publication so they can follow SVRA or Trans Am or former original, all of the groups that race. So that's easy. Go outside and get a SVRA membership and for $150, then you can go to all the races. So there's people that we have now, it's kind of cool that are doing, they'll camp around the United States and, and literally follow us or follow Trans Am and our, where we do joint events. So that's kind of neat. As a racer, you can get an SVRA membership if you have a competition license. And then the benefit of that is it's 250 bucks I think, for a, a license. And that gives you the magazine, but it also gives you a discount off of event that you enter as an SVRA member so you save a few bucks it's more than you race one race and it pays for itself and so we did do it that way because we want to build the scale of our data to that's good for our sponsors and it's good for our racers that we keep the prices cost down as much as we can with when you look at the venues we race at it's a big commitment on our part to rent those tracks and put on those events so we want to make sure we go right you know, uh, and, and your website is just filled with a lot of awesome information about what you're doing, where you're going, what's coming up. It's that that's that's another great way of, of getting acquainted with SVRA. You mentioned your magazine. I'm familiar with that. Very well done. Glossy color, beautiful publication. So, you know, Tony, thank you. Thank you for all your information today. Thank you for spending time on our program. And gosh, it's just, I, I can't wait to get more in tune with what you're doing and, and kind of catch up like everybody coming out of the COVID era. You know, we kind of, we kind of just got a little lost and you obviously did not. You kept, you kept right on going. God bless you. We, we did. It was, it was scary, but uh, you know, going through COVID, my number one thing was I wanted to keep the team working and 
there was so much uncertainty that you had to think about. And then when we did go back to racing in between, how do we do it where we're not a super spreader event the competitors safe? So I, I feel like we navigated it as well as it could be. We were lucky. We did a lot right. We were also lucky because nobody on the team got sick. I don't know if a racer got sick at one of our events, but we were as you know thoughtful and careful as we could be with masks, vaccinations, distance, all the hand sanitizer, all the stuff that you would assume. We we did as best we could, and thankfully we, we were fortunate. But uh, Jeff, thanks for having me on. I hope I hope this is uh, first. You know, hope this is well received and. and follow up stuff anytime just reach out and we'll get it scheduled well that's awesome and we'll keep you in the loop of everything that we're doing and i know your time is valuable with everything you have going on and again thank you very much for your time the great information and i encourage everyone who is looking at this broadcast to go to the website check it out look at the sponsors look at the partners the, the what what tony has built here is absolutely amazing thank you tony thanks so much Jeff. i appreciate you having me on the show Bye -bye. Uh...